Hi, I'm Justine Toe. And I'm Simon Smart. And you're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. Well, World Poetry Day is this week, and on Life and Faith we thought we would like to celebrate it. This is one of Simon's favourites. Days pass when I forget the mystery. Problems insoluble and problems offering their own ignored solutions jostle for my attention. And then, once more the quiet mystery is present to me. The throng's clamour recedes. The mystery that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything rather than void. And that, O oh Lord, Creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it. Now, Simon, why do you like that poem? It's by Denise Levitov. Yeah, I really like the poem. It reminds me that in the busyness of life, we can sometimes forget about important things. Uh, The poem speaks of stopping and remembering the wonder and the beauty of nature, the universe, or whatever you want to call it, and the astonishing sustaining of that universe by God. That's the point that she's trying to get to there. And of course, Christianity has this huge affirmation of the physical created world that's celebrated in this poem. So what about you, Justine? What have you got for us? Well, it's funny, the poem that I have also celebrates the the creation uh, in a particular way. This is Pied Beauty from Gerald Manley Hopkins. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple colour as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Yeah, what, what's, the, what's the thing that gets you in about that one? I really like the line, all things counter, original, spare, strange. Because I think that we live today in a world that is all about diversity. You know, like we, want, we don't want to think about one way of doing things. We want plenty of ways of doing things. And there's no one way of life, perhaps, that, um, that is best. And Christianity has often been criticised in the past that it's about imposing uniformity and making everyone kind of conform. But... You know, I think this poem by Gerald Manley Hopkins says that this teeming variety of life in all its assorted and irregular forms kind of points the finger at, or it points to a God that loves variety, that loves difference, that is interested in multiplicity. He's not interested in uniformity. So, yeah, I really like the idea of, you know, glory be to God for dappled things. And I also have to say I have a bit of rural nostalgia, even though I've had yeah. no access to that in uh, my life. I was going to say, you've never been out of the city ever. No, Justin. no, not quite, no. All right, well, poetry might not be everyone's thing. It takes a bit of work. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to know what the poet's getting at. But even with that, most people can remember a stirring stanza or two from a favourite poem. And sometimes a poem will hit you in the gut. It'll sort of express something so powerfully in a really concentrated way that you find yourself rocked by it or inspired or, or moved. Yeah, and it sounds as though um, contemporary songs can also do that as well. You know, uh, people have song lyrics that they connect with and, I mean, maybe this is... You, you don't like the sound of this, but maybe that is modern poetry for many people, contemporary songs, pop music. Yeah, I think it can be, for sure. Now, Greg Clark is the CEO of the Bible Society of Australia. He's got his uh, doctorate in literature, in English literature, and has a real love for poetry. I wanted to talk to him about poetry, so I caught up with him in his office. I first asked Greg... What is poetry? Uh, Well, poetry is really making things with words. Uh, It's where you get the word poetry from it. It means literally to make something. Um, And it's about making words in a special way. Uh, I heard a uh, cricket commentator once talking about poetry, believe it or not. He'd uh, just read a poem on the radio that he loved, and he said, that's just a top poem, isn't it? It's top words in a top order. Well, that's really quite a good definition of poetry. You know, it's a great choice of words, wonderfully arranged so that something new is made and that thing happens to be made out of words. Why do we enjoy poetry? What's it doing for us when we find a poem that we really love? Well, it's more than just meaning, isn't it? I mean, we can get meaning from all sorts of 
writing. You, know, you can read the encyclopedia and you can understand something. But poetry has an effect on you. It's a more holistic thing than uh, other forms of writing. Um, poets choose great images that capture uh, the sense of either an experience or an emotion or a place or an event. Um, and they give us a fresh way of looking at the world. Often poets uh, find a way of explaining an experience that changes the way you think about it forever. Uh, even if it's just one image or one word that changes your perception of reality from that point on. It's a very clever and, uh, and uh, powerful form of art. What do you think is happening for the poet? What do they get from writing poetry? Mm, well, I guess there's all sorts of poets, aren't there? There's, uh, there's the bed- bedroom poet where you just write really for your own reflection. You stick it in the bedside drawer and that no one else sees it, probably mercifully. Um, but I guess when a poet is wanting to publish their work and others to read it, um, they're trying to bring that inner experience they have to life for other people. They're trying to bring their singular vision of the world uh, into contact with others. It's a way of calling out to other people. I think poets um, are often people who are, are deeply affected by the world around them or by relationships um, or by uh, experiences they have. And they need to structure those in a form of words. And uh, they often, uh, I think the poets that, uh, that I've uh, met often talk about the, the urge to write poetry. They can't resist it, it's like an urge. It seems like poetry particularly lends itself to an expression of uh, ideas related to spiritual things. Uh, There's lots of great religious poetry. And of course, the Bible contains lots of poetry, doesn't it? Why is that? Why would God choose to communicate in that form? It's a beautiful thing about uh, Christianity in particular, the Judeo-Christian scriptures, that uh, the forms in which we can receive our knowledge of God and our our, uh, relationship with God are, are often poetic. They're, uh, they're symbols, they're metaphors, they're, they're images. Um, I think it's, uh, there is some sort of natural connection between poetry and religion. It's, it's uh, something that, it's hard to explain, but I think it's to do with the depth of meaning that you can capture in words. That religion is about trying to, to, to suck the marrow of life and get to the essence of life. And poetry seems to be able to do that quite well for us. So if you read the uh, Psalms in the Bible, you hear, uh, for example, the figure of David, the old king of Israel, crying out to God um, in in great anguish often, or celebrating his relationship with God in all sorts of ways. And we experience that same kind of relationship with God as a result of reading the poem. So it really does connect us to God in, in quite a deep way. I think these things can be over can be overstated as if literature itself were religion. But when the poetry is reflecting some deep reality about God that the poet is trying to communicate, that, that's when the magic starts to kick in. I happen to know you love Les Murray's poetry. Why is that? Oh, Les Murray, one of the great Australian poets, um, probably one of the greatest poets in the world today. Um, I, I love him for a lot of reasons. To start with, he is concerned with the deepest things of life. His Every volume is dedicated to the glory of God. Um, but he wears that that religious depth uh, lightly and strangely. And so reading Les Murray is um, always a confusing and unsettling experience because he chooses such bizarre words and bizarre syntax uh, in order to communicate. Um, but he has a view that, that religion and poetry are, are very closely connected. In fact, one of his po- poems, his famous poems, is called Poetry and Religion. Uh, and I love the line from that where he, he says, you can't pray a lie, said Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn. You can't poe one either. And poetry seems to only work when it's getting to the deepest truths about the world. Is there something about poetry that picks up on this idea that as human beings, we're, we're something more than just physical, material beings? Yeah, well, poetry is a, a great example of that, isn't it? It's, um, it is a sort of physical thing. You can read the words on the page. But so much more is going on when you come into contact with a poem. It's like music or, um, or art um, or feeling a breeze on your face on a, on a really beautiful autumn day. Uh, there's something, that, something deeper that happens as a result of the experience. And I think it's, it is something to do with the wonderful capacity of words for human beings to not just be a form of communication between people, but to deeply reflect reality. You know, people talk about the magic of maths and uh, the way that it's stunning that maths can actually represent the world. 
Well, in a similar way, poetry, in just the simple choice of one word over another, can actually get you into contact with the deepest things of life. Um, I think it's underestimated, and it's a shame that most people come into contact with poetry in the school classroom, where it can be a really horrible experience. You know, it's just part of the drudgery of the day. You've got to get through the English lesson. Whereas if you take those poems out of that kind of context and think about them in relation to the world that you're living, the, your family life, nature, um, sex and relationships, you know, the, the things that really matter to the average student, uh, then they come alive. And I think poetry's got this special power to bring language and meaning alive for people in ways that they never forget. That was Greg Clark, the CEO of the Bible Society. Now, it seems to me, Simon, that, uh, and this is kind of what Greg was alluding to, that poetry perhaps picks up on this idea that we're not simply material beings. Is that right? That's right. It's a nice bit of alliteration in that question, Justine. <laughs> but, yeah, these days you increasingly hear people say that we're only complex machines or animals with big brains. Uh, it's a denial of the non-material aspects of life. But you have to ask, do any of these things that we can't measure or touch but seem to make life worth living, music and poetry, literature and art and so on, do any of these things make sense outside a framework that includes the spiritual, perhaps God, in it? Uh, can we account for them if we're just physical beings? Well, I guess in, in that frame it's hard to think of what evolutionary benefit you could, you, know, you could attribute to poetry, for example. Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch, I, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Um, but I guess what's really powerful also about poetry in particular is this notion of beauty, you know, like like the, kind of what you were saying before, you sometimes really experience something profound in poetry, but also in plenty of other ways, such as engaging with art or maybe standing on a mountaintop um, or looking at a, a sunset. It's like an echo of something that's beyond our material existence. It kind of feels like it can't just be all that there is. Yeah, C.S. Lewis talks about this when he said that the experience of beauty awakes in us a kind of desire for what he called our own far-off country. Uh, I like the way he expressed that. Uh, he says, through exposure to beauty, we feel like we're longing for something that can't be had in this world. Uh, Lewis would, would argue that that's God calling us through the poetry or whatever the, you know, the medium is. And he also adds that we find, if we find within ourselves a desire that no experience that we can actually get in the world can truly satisfy, then the most likely explanation is that we were called for something else or, or someone else, he would say. He would say, for God. Uh, now, that could be a longing or an ache for justice or forgiveness, for reconciliation, for hope, all those sorts of things, for good relationships, community. I think those things are caught up in some of what we get in this type of thing. And I'd argue that there is much about being a human that presents a challenge to those who want to just say, oh, we're just complex physical beings. I think poetry might well be one of those. Here's Greg Clark again with a Les Murray classic. Poetry and Religion by Les Murray. Religions are poems. They concert our daylight and dreaming mind, our emotions, instinct, breath and native gesture into the only whole thinking, poetry. Nothing's said till it's dreamed out in words and nothing's true that figures in words only. A poem, compared with an arrayed religion, may be like a soldier's one short marriage night to die and live by. But that is a small religion. Full religion is the large poem in loving repetition. Like any poem, it must be inexhaustible and complete with turns where we ask, now why did the poet do that? You can't pray a lie, said Huckleberry Finn. You can't poe one either. It's the same mirror, mobile, glancing. We call it poetry. Fixed centrally, we call it a religion. And God is the poetry caught in any religion. Caught, not imprisoned. Caught as in a mirror that he attracted, being in the world as poetry is in the poem, a law against its closure. There'll always be religion around while there is poetry, or a lack of it. Both are given, and intermittent, as the action of those birds, crested pigeon, rosella parrot, who fly with wings shut, then beating, and again shut. Well, that was a classic from Les Murray. Hope you enjoy World Poetry Day. Catch you next time. <laughs>